Hello, this is Dean Kernut, and welcome to the Alpha Exchange, where we explore topics in financial markets associated with managing risk, generating return, and the deployment of capital in the alternative investment industry. A quarter century ago, as the original tech bubble began in earnest, the American Stock Exchange was full of action. Populated with an aggressive throng of option traders, the Amex was a critical liquidity venue during a period of heady growth in the U.S. listed options market. It was here, starting as a clerk, that Dave Puritz began to hone the craft that underpins his role today as founder and CIO of Shaolin Capital Management. Through our discussion, we learn of Dave's sell-side experience as a listed option trader at B of A, and then as head of convertible bond trading at Deutsche Bank and the lessons he gathered in balancing the facilitation of customer business with the management of proprietary positions. Much of our conversation centers on converts, an asset class in which Dave and Shaolin have gained prominence. Reflecting on the tremendous issuance already in 2021, Dave finds it important to assess the combination of high implied volatility and long duration associated with recent large deals. A very active participant in the SPAC market, Dave sees plenty of opportunity here but argues that the entry price matters and believes it is better to be a buyer of unloved securities than part of a gold rush in which valuation is cast aside. Lastly, we explore Dave's philosophy on tail risk hedging and how he utilizes both the listed options market and credit protection to defend the portfolio against the disruption event that have become a frequent reality in modern markets. I hope you enjoy this episode of the Alpha Exchange, my conversation with Dave Puritz. My guest today on the Alpha Exchange is Dave Puritz. He's the founder and CIO of Shaolin Capital Management. Dave, it is excellent to have you on the podcast today. Thanks, Dean. I'm looking forward to it. Always a pleasure to catch up with you. We do have a little bit of history, so always fun to hear your voice. Yeah, well, we go back a ways. We're back to right around the turn of the century. Also a pretty frenetic time in markets. Uh, I Joined Bank of America. You were a trader there. I was on the sales side. And I want to say you were trading tech vol at the time. And so that was kind of hairy. Two decades later, we've got a little bit of a setup that's similar, but you've done quite a bit over the course of your career. Of course, you're now running your own fund and you've spent previous time on the buy side and also the sell side. Let's get into it. I'm excited to have this conversation with you. Tell us how you got first started in, in the area of finance and then specifically on the derivatives front. When I got out of college, it was 1996, and I had been an English major, basically spending my college days reviewing literature, and I had a minor in government doing things that were totally non-finance related, although they definitely come to play in managing risk, and we could talk about that later. I had no job. I was not sure what I was going to do out of school, and my mom knew somebody in our little local community where I grew up, which was called Roosevelt Island. It's in New York City. And she was the head of HR for a firm called Spear Leeds and Kellogg, which, amongst other things, was a specialist firm on the floor of New York, the Amex, they were on the Pecos, they were on the SIBO. And I did a trader training program, a rotation program. And my first experience was on the Amex floor, clerking for derivative specialists and names like Intel and Four Systems and Motorola. And then I did a little bit of time, again, as an intern or a trainee, Troster Singer, which became SLKC, which was, you know, the equity OTC arm, right, you know, as the NASDAQ was cresting out. They pulled me out of the program early and put me on the floor of the Amex where, you know, I clerked for about a year and change before becoming a specialist in options. And so that was really my first job, an introduction to finance. Spear eventually was bought out by Goldman. I had moved on to B of A, where we got to know each other. But that was my introduction to derivatives. It was my introduction to finance and really my first sort of foray into the business. People tend to be colored a little bit by their early days. Perhaps folks that you know started in 2004 or five thought that the VIX was supposed to be at 12 forever. And if you started in 2008, you know, you'd have a totally different experience. You're starting during the period when, you know, Greenspan was a bit early, but he uttered the words irrational exuberance. And we certainly had a big, bad tech bull market at the time and just lots of motion in stocks. Tell us a little bit about some of the learning experiences early on as you were risk managing an options book. Well, I mean, I got a lot of coffee, (laughs) took care of a lot of paperwork and dealt with, you know, a really very different culture on the Amex floor. And 
frankly, wasn't really sure what I looked at or was looking at for the first three to six months, just trying to figure out derivatives. You mentioned this in your question, but recency bias is obviously a very important thing. And I think as you sort of trade through different environments, it's important to remember what you don't know or what you haven't seen and continue to think of those as real possibilities or potential outcomes for markets, even if you haven't experienced them yourself. That environment obviously it was the run up into the crest of the tech bubble in the late 90s. When I became a specialist, I had was given names that were quote unquote sleepy like VeriSign or Ameritrade. And on any given day, they'd be up or down 20%, mainly up. And I had sort of a handful of screaming locals on the floor of the exchange yelling at me on call spreads and calls and puts, trying to lift offers and hit bids. A very different environment, you know, pre-automation in a lot of ways, but an extremely valuable learning experience. First of all, it was fun. I don't think there's a work environment that really replicates what went on on the floors of the exchange. But More importantly, I learned a lot about using flow and thinking about flow and market activity as a way to craft positions. So we often think about this here at Shaolin is we're not really in the prediction business. You know, we're in the construction business and and our job is to construct a a durable portfolio informed by a macro view, but also really high value expressions on both the long and short side. What I learned was that you can't really force those the prices that you want at all moments in time. You have to let them come to you and you have to build appropriately. So I think understanding how markets worked at the transactional level, how flow worked, that really informed our overall philosophy and how we think about portfolio construction here and now. Well, you were seeing a lot of this flow specifically on the floor of the Amex. And then, of course, you and I met uh, during our time at Bank of America, and you were seeing a lot of flow there as well. So this is circa, call it 2000, 2001. I think we overlap for a year or two. And this was a, one of the rare time periods where vol was actually a pretty good deal for an extended period of time. There was the advent of the long vol hedge fund. So you're in a liquidity providing seat and you got folks like me yelling at you to try to make prices and provide liquidity smartly to folks that were demanding optionality. What was that balance like for you in terms of running your own book, but also being a liquidity provider to the bank's customer base? the job had a large proprietary component, meaning that that flow you were meant to not just trade through and broker, but to make money using the opportunities that were brought to you by salespeople such as yourself. The flip side of that is we learned that it's also only a people business and it remains a people business. And so relationships and finding the middle ground between clients and firm needs in terms of risk, you know, trying to navigate and find a balance between those different objectives It's something that helped me as I moved kind of through the ranks on the sell side and, you know, built relationships that have served me well to this day, both on the issuer side, whether it's a corporate and we're talking about convertibles or large institutional side where it can be a very fair business. You have to know when to stand up for yourself and when to be accommodative and who to work with and who not to. But the people component or finding that middle ground was something that I think I excel at just being able to have good reasoning for when something made sense for the firm to do and really good reasoning when it was right to say no. And if you do that enough times and are right enough times, salespeople like yourself kind of stop yelling at you and work with you on stuff. So that was a good introduction to kind of figuring out how to make the sell side work because every trade is multiple parties involved with different interests and the deal is a deal, meaning a, a good deal is something that suits both parties. Figuring that out and understanding what actually went on in markets, it was just a continuation of that education. And of course, you had a chance at one point in your career to make a big leap to do something on the convert side, and the rest for you career-wise is kind of history. So we'll obviously walk through what you're up to now, but walk us through some of what was on your mind as you transitioned to a sister asset class related, but certainly very different at the same time on the convert side. You mentioned it in terms of volatility and converts are interesting because again, we have, we have so many moving parts. There's obviously volatility, there's credit. There's dividends and borrow. There's also a variety of different market participants that use them for different things. So we take that as a starting ground. Now, when I moved into Converts, we were trading almost like a pod structure at the of A. So I would do semiconductors, let's say volatility listed vol and semis, 
but also convertibles. And at that time, convertibles were an IG product. You know, they were, there's tons of CDS, there were asset swaps. It was L plus 20 or L plus 50, really large mega cap on the run names. So people thought of it as a volatility proxy by and large and prime brokers and banks funded them as such. What it really introduced me to though over time and something that people I think didn't really think about that much in the product was this concept of vol and credit correlation. And the fact that over the life cycle of a convertible bond, it doesn't make sense for a very wide credit spread to have a very low volatility. Is there a reason for that? Or is that an opportunity? Because through the life cycle of that bond, if you can price and underwrite things like bankruptcy or recovery, you can look at a range of outcomes that are a reflection of volatility and credit, not just vol. So it's sort of like adding an extra dimension to thinking about risk. I was going to say thinking about vol, but one could say that if you were a credit trader, thinking about vol is an extension of credit. So it's kind of neither here nor there. It's just that there's a heavy correlation. I think as Chris Cole would say, vol and credit are cousins, maybe not brothers and sisters, but cousins. And convertibles have a ton of nuance and embody a lot of that relationship. So it was a great introduction to thinking about credit adjusted vol or floating strike vol as opposed to on the run counterparty risk free listed volatility. It remains an incredibly interesting asset class with a number of people looking at it for different reasons. So that transition I made must have been like 2001. I went to Deutsche Bank and ran a convertibles book there eventually became head of converts in 05 and ran that business from 2005 to 2010 when I did it globally for Nomura. And that was a whole, you know, introduction to Asia and Europe in a way that I hadn't really managed risk in those regions before. So that was a new experience as well. But convertibles themselves are just like 3D ball. And in the credit component, not just pricing those two variables or thinking about how they can move, but how they should move together and how do those combinations present value that became sort of the underpinning to how I thought about risk management and what we do at Shellen. When you think back to your time, let's say at Deutsche, and you guys were always aggressive on the pricing side, you had a lot of synchronicity, I would say, between sales and trading. So you got a lot of hedge fund business done, perhaps without necessarily the benefit of a giant calendar, as some of your competitors might have had. It was really the blocking and tackling efforts of the sales and trading side, at least from the outside looking in. What are the similarities in the coordination of sales and trading on the convert side relative to the listed option side? And then what are the differences as well? There's sort of a pre-trace era and a post-trace era in terms of understanding that. And I'd probably respond by just opening that what we did at Deutsche Bank, we had to, as you alluded to, the only way to really deliver on profit targets and make money was to run it on a proprietary basis and use capital to drive flood. And so that's what we did, right? We weren't sitting at JP Morgan or Bank of America where, you know, had a certain amount of underwriting fees to kind of support the business and then flow could be sort of a secondary object. Not that that's what those guys did. It's just a nice way to start. I was jealous, frankly, at the time. We turned kind of the sales trading dynamic to our advantage in that environment. As you mentioned, we were very liquidity friendly. We used our balance sheet to be either best bid or best offer and drive trades, knowing that within a certain risk framework, we felt the other side of the trade was easy to find. Pre-trace, you relied on your sales force and of course, other market participants who you got to know well, other clients for information and for color on not just what's going on with a particular bond, but what's going on in the marketplace and what are different people doing. There was no kind of transparency on price discovery. So there was no beyond you know, broker runs, nothing printed. And as a result, sort of the price volatility or the discrepancy between different prices could be pretty violent. So ultimately that became sort of a test of your belief and your belief was validated on whether or not you can make buyers or sellers in the context of what you thought was the right price. There are oftentimes you say, well, this is where I'm willing to buy them. I don't really care if Goldman is offered down a point because we want to get these on the book. Other times that wasn't the case and you had to use your salespeople and work closely with them who, by the way, have the exact same objective as you do. And we shared that. And I think that was key to our success to generate the kind of book we wanted and also to make clients happy. So I always thought of sales and trading as two sides of the same coin. We're not opposed to each other. We both want to build important client relationships and do it in a way that protects the firm's risk. Traders have to understand the value of that 
and what their salespeople are doing. And the salespeople have to respect that as well. And if everybody's on the same page, the system can function well in that middle ground. It's easy to find. So that was sort of the calling card of what we did at DB. We've got a bumper year already in convert issuance. And I'm just looking at a couple of numbers here. Of course, this stuff you're intimately familiar with, but Airbnb, two billion, Twitter, a billion and a quarter, Beyond Meat did a large deal. And we've got this environment where, of course, rates are just about zero. Credit spreads are relatively tight, not the tightest, of course. And then equity vol is very, very high at the same time. And stock prices are high too. It's going back a ways, but you've got a great memory. So if you think back to 2005, you had in some ways the opposite. You had higher rates, call them five-ish percent, and vol that was extremely low. The VIX probably averaged 12 or 13 for 2005 and six. So what does that mean, big picture, in terms of the types of companies that come to market, the types of investors that find the convert market attractive in terms of allocating capital to? How would you compare and contrast that period to this one? Just a quick stat to touch on this. The first week in March in 2021 was bigger than any March since 2014 in terms of issuance. So just that first week was better than any previous March for almost a decade or seven years. So a long period of time, and it has been extremely busy prior to COVID. We were looking at a 200 billion US convert market that I wouldn't be surprised if it's doubled by the end of this year. So it's obviously grown a ton. Now, in terms of different environments, I would say that a tight credit spread, low rate, high vol environment sounds like it's perfect for issues. And it is. So we're getting a lot of new deals. When you can do a zero to half a percent convertible and forward sell your equity up 50, 60, 70%, that's attractive funding. Again, that's the product of, as you mentioned, the low rate environment, relatively tight credit spreads, and high volatility. If I go back and think to previous periods, there's some important differences that we can talk about, including sort of a sea change in convertibles that happened around the financial crisis. But 05 is really a period pronounced by low volatility. And so while absolute vols were low, I think running into that period, a lot of convert managers, they didn't move their vols down aggressively enough. And as a result, there were a lot of problems with delta hedging and being overhedged into up and out call options that as vols came drifting in, they were sort of feeding on themselves. It was a largely hedge fund environment very different than the one today. I think that's probably the important segue because this market's undergone some serious transformation. So prior to 08, the convert market was largely investment grade. 70, 75% IG dominated by hedge funds with about 80% plus hedge fund participation in the market. So you had very liquid credit surfaces, very liquid volatility services, and very aggressive PB and funding regimes at the banks. So the general model for convert ARB, and there is no ARB today, and that's the beauty and sort of the important difference of the market now versus then, and why we don't say we do convert ARB, then you really could ARB it. You know, you could do a some of the parts A plus B is a discount to C, you could lever it, and that was your return stream. And that's where a lot of convert ARB guys sort of made their name. And it's sort of the period of time that a lot of investors and allocators associate with convertibles from a hedge perspective. Now, if you look past the crisis and happened with bank delevering and some tax changes that impacted issuers in the convert space, you're looking at a market that is 75% plus high yield and unrated. 90% of new deals are high yield and unrated. There's no CDS. Often there's no straight debt for most convertibles, the vast majority. And you have all surfaces that these companies have, there's a wider range in terms of size and market cap, with the exception of, as you mentioned, things like Airbnb and mega cap tech. There's a lot of small and mid cap issuers in the convert space. Now, that market is more conducive to the environment that I described or the training environment that we tend to thrive in because the issuer base doesn't have observable, hedgeable variables on credit, often less liquid volatility services. Hence the opportunity to make a qualitative call and use credit research. And we talk about this a lot here. I think this is the last uncrowded area of credit to underwrite companies that we think would trade much tighter on a spread basis in the high yield market. The other thing that's really important to note is that hedge fund participation post the unwind, post financial crisis, went from 75, 80% to 20, 25%. And 
still to this day, the most important market participants are long only. There's indexers, there's equity income funds that think about the proxy, the convertible as an equity proxy with a little bit better upside downside than the equity itself. And they trade it as such. They're not concerned with the total return variable that's embedded in the product, but much more focused on a directional view of the equity. So that creates opportunities to trade in the secondary as well. The issuers change, the investor base change quite a bit. Both those things together kind of suit our trading style because we're open to credit risk. We do the work around that and we get the opportunities and dislocations to do things that you wouldn't find, as I mentioned, in more heavily trafficked or better understood traditional areas of credit. Convertibles can be different things at different times, but that's the big picture sea change that drives a lot of the opportunity we see today in the last few years. Let's pivot to your firm. So you're the founder of Shaolin. So tell us about the process for starting that, when you started that, and then the investment objective that you're putting out to your investors. How do you frame that for potential investors? Our goal is to provide high value, non-correlated return streams, positive non-correlated return streams through long periods of time and full market cycles. Our goal is not to aggregate capital. It's a boutique approach to what we do. It's a one book business. We don't sleeve off to different investment managers or traders or PMs, different aspects of the business. It's literally finding the best long and short expressions to give your book a top-down participation in the market that we think might be warranted at a given moment in time. So it's very long-term oriented. It's very much about non-correlated return streams. We're negatively correlated to the S&P. We're not correlated or zero correlation high yield. We're not even correlated really to the convert index that much. And so our return stream looks a little bit different. And frankly, that's kind of the only thing you should be paying for, right? If what you're doing is highly correlated to S&P, it doesn't make a ton of sense to pay in our dreams to in 20. Nobody's getting that unless the Shaw or somebody like that. But hedge fund type fee structures, it's because you're offering a product that people can't replicate easily elsewhere. We're long-term oriented. We want people that buy into our value proposition. We're meant to be a small firm, a boutique. We're not trying to sleeve off and expand in different areas of the business based on market or investor demand. And the last thing I mentioned is that we're highly opportunistic. We run large amounts of cash when things cheapen or become attractive, whether it's SPACs or convertibles at different moments in time. We're very aggressive pivoting into those. So high level, I mean, since I have a track record for Blue Mountain, let's say since 2015, there's maybe three or four months where the S&P has been down that we haven't been up. And opportunities like that are often really good ones for repositioning the book and higher value expressions. Again, whether they're credit or SPAC oriented, balanced convertibles, there's a variety of different ways to express a long bias, but it's that levering and deleveraging event that we try to be opportunistic about and agnostic in terms of asset class, but focus on absolute return, not relative value. If you do that through cycles, I think you end up having a book populated with really attractive long expressions, really attractive short expressions. If they're balanced correctly, you should have solid non-correlated returns through cycles. And that's been our objective. You mentioned low and sometimes even negative correlation of results, and you're right, that's a real source of value. One area where the correlation assumption seems to be getting a large revisit is just on this notion of owning bonds as a hedge to a risk asset portfolio, right? We're seeing the bond side actually cause, in some ways, the equity market to fall. So I'm curious, when you think about running the convert book and the interest rate risk side, especially as rates are so low and obviously starting to rise... What are the hedging implications for that part of your book in terms of, are there defensive trades that you put in place to hedge the interest rate risk? And what, if so, do those look like? I would start by introducing, and I know your listeners are familiar with the concept of risk parity, but it's a really important thing to keep in mind because if you rewind 100 years and take out the last 20 bonds and stocks, bonds have been a hedge proxy for equities and vice versa for most of our financial history. And I think what was recognized with the advent of risk parity was that all of a sudden you had all this data that showed that they hedge each other. But due to government intervention in financial markets, we were moving into a regime where they went in concert with each other. And that, of course, represented an incredibly lucrative marketing opportunity for people who do risk parity because you could win on both sides, which they did for long, long periods of time. Now, if we're talking about the unwind of that concept, which is kind of what you are, 
and the risk that bonds and stocks move in tandem down, rates go higher and stocks go lower. We do think of that as an important risk. And it's all about that narrative of government intervention in financial markets, the efficacy of that potentially wavering in investors' minds, which again, we can dive off into for a very long conversation about that. But as it pertains to hedging in our book, there are two ways in which we handle that. First of all, we don't own a book of five to seven year duration zero coupon bonds at high premiums because you have a lot of rate risk. So first of all, they're coming at the wrong price. They're coming at very tight credit spreads and very high volatilities. When you have tight credit spreads and high volatilities, you think you have more ways to win or less. You have less. So we just don't own that. That's the first thing. I don't have to hedge a lot of rate risk because I don't have a lot of duration. And so when we think about our portfolio construction, the next step is to think about what's that tied to what area of the market. And as we're seeing right now, we saw at the end of last year, it's really tied to what we're seeing between the NASDAQ, the growth-oriented stories that rely on low rates to keep their multiples where they are, and duration. So what we've been looking to do is by 2023 and in, in the money, tech convertibles, good credits, really large market caps that are synthetic puts that we feel very comfortable with on the way down. And this is putting that cross-asset hat on, wow, we're really worried about the bond market sell-off. Well, one way you can do that is by buying puts and buying convertibles to do so on tech volatility. For most people, they wouldn't think of that as a rate hedge, right? You're hedging your rates by buying bonds. Well, in this case, you are, because we're talking about 70 to 100 delta convertibles or 30 delta to zero delta puts that are attracted in our view, given this potential unwind of the rate regime that's been in place really since 87, but is pronounced in investors' minds since 2008. It kind of brings to mind another kind of story. I remember when I worked for Andrew at, at Blue Mountain, he asked how we were hedging rates. And this was, I guess, going into, uh, I guess, when Yellen raised rates. It was the end of 16, maybe? End of 15, exactly. My bad. So we had rates, obviously, extremely tight. And we had volatility in names like, well, the entire market, but I'm thinking of the real estate space. Vol was towards a sort of cyclical and maybe secular nadir. So extremely low volatility. And he asked how we were hedging our rates. I said, well, I'm buying a bunch of in-the-money REIT convertibles that no outright account wants to own because they're too far away from par. And this was the summer before that. So it was summer of 15. He goes, how are you hedging rates by buying REIT converts? Because we had outright selling to those to us at two, three, four volatility, single digit vol. And obviously when Yellen did go and raise names like SO Green or DDR, there were a handful of them, good credits, but the stocks all corrected into that and around that event. And we have the same accounts paying us 25, 30 volatility for puts they were basically giving away at zero. So there are a lot of ways to skin a cat. And I think that's how we think about our portfolio construction in a moment like this. Sometimes the very simplistic rate hedge is not the most efficient way or high value way to add some duration protection or rate protection, row protection to your portfolio. That's a great analysis of finding a Pretty interesting proxy hedge. And certainly it's been the case that folks have stared at these high flyers in tech. And clearly it's hard to short something outright that has got, or at least had so much price momentum. But as you say, it's proven to be vulnerable to higher rates. It's playing out now. And then of course, the equity vol surface part of this has not really given you many bargains either. So to find a proxy that's on the cheaper side is really interesting to hear about. If you're a directional investor in convertibles and you're worried about Workday because you think the stock's going lower, you're looking for bids on Workday convertibles. So just as those puts should be bought, volatility is going up. The volatility is going down in the convertible because the supply factor for directional investors creates opportunity for hedged investors that are focused on sourcing that volatility, not betting on Workday price movement. It's just a great example of the multifaceted nature of convertibles and that sometimes they're for products that have so many different moving parts and investors who look at them in so many different ways. There's often really novel and efficient ways to create aspects of portfolio expression that on the surface wouldn't resonate with somebody who just did credit or just did volatility. It was just long, short equity. So it's just a really interesting product when you think about sort of the multifaceted nature of it through cycles. 
Well, I've been doing this a long time, but I had not heard the term Workday Vol, so I like that. <laughs> That's a good one. As you describe the buying and selling and convert, sometimes folks are doing things for different reasons. And this is, of course, what makes market opportunity. And so I want to go back. It's about a year ago now, so there's going to be a lot of revisiting of the calamity that literally was just about to start a year ago. We saw a new all-time high in the VIX. We saw a absolute explosion of credit spreads higher. We even saw the risk-free asset buckle ultimately for a period of time there. So walk us through what you were seeing there on the way in, the kind of defensive trades that you were able to implement on the risk management side. Um, Love to get your perspective on those bad days of March of 2020. Yeah. I mean, they were trying times. One thing we always try to remember is that pain, if you're doing this right, comes with opportunity. And that's because everybody wants cheaper prices. If it was, they want to have bought something cheaper and have it be marked where it is now. Usually, obviously, you have to have it cheaper and take that pain to get to the point where there's really high value, high conviction investments to put in your book. So with that in mind and being 100% value oriented or, or absolute return oriented, February of 2020 was not cheap. There were a lot of things that were concerning, both in terms of the level of complacency out there, as well as in the pricing of the worlds in which we traffic. So less so in SPACs, but certainly in converts, credits were, like today, extremely tight. There didn't seem to be a lot of margin of error, meaning that you know, at L plus 50 or L plus 100, you know exactly what you can make. So those are really sort of the pennies being picked up in front of bulldozers. Those prices were not attractive, by and large, to an investor like ourselves that's focused on wider credit spreads and better absolute return opportunities. So as a result, and given some of the sentiment indicators, market indicators that gave us some pause, we were about 40, 45% on encumbered cash going into March. And we always run the money cash. So I mean, right now our cash sits at in the low 30s and has never been lower than 18 since the inception of the fund. The way we were protected was obviously high value converts that we like, but more importantly on the portfolio side, a lot of S&P protection. So downside put protection. You and I have talked about this before, but we don't really believe in put spreads that much. We don't really believe in one by twos. If you want your protection to act like protection and to be able to trade stock around it, which we do, that's a sunk cost that we're willing to pay based on the market environment and based on the cost of that protection. So we had a pretty healthy, obviously strike sensitive downside book in S&P, and I think maybe some Russell and Q's as well, targeting some moving averages, nothing fancy. And that's one very important part of our portfolio protection, just like today, where we have very healthy amounts of that sitting in the book. We also had, and I think this is an important point on hedging, you need to have floating strike protection. Now, for some people, that could be sort of like a variant swap or a vol swap. For us, that takes the form of credit protection because there's no strike term or local concerns around spot that are that important there, right? It's really far left tail protection. So after you've blown through all your S&P strikes, unless you want to run massive amounts of short S&P with your in-the-money puts, which we don't, we've covered a lot of that delta, right? We've made money on that. Gamma, effectively, the last part of the book that protects you against true deleveraging is credit protection. And for us, we did that in the form of, well, without overcomplicating it, financial company subordinated or knock in almost like cocoa debt in Europe, financial issuers that in particular in Canada, that were trading L plus 100 on a yield to call basis with 20 year puts and massive amounts of convexity to the downside because as funding and financing blew out, those durations would blow out accordingly and they were very sensitive to wider credit spreads. We had that, we had some CDS index and things like that. The floating strike part of your book really carried us through sort of the back end of the sell-off and most closely resembles true deleveraging. And true deleveraging is a funding problem. It's a financing problem. And For us, that's a position where we want to be able to buy because those opportunities, you mentioned we've been doing this a long time. There are sell-offs that are valuation-oriented, sort of -of run-of-the-mill, overextended equity rallies that turn over and draw down and we trade those. Real deleveraging doesn't happen that often. And how many 2020s have you had 
I maybe had like three. That was one of those events where most of the market was unable to buy. And everybody was calling a handful of people, ourselves included, to say, what can you pay for this? And in an environment like that, that's a great opportunity for shopping for our investors. It allows us to build returns in our book that can pay us for years to come. So those were an opportunity when markets were completely dislocated. We had our credit protection kick in and protect us. And we built out the long side of our book opportunistically into a falling knife. But again, when you can underwrite credits and you're looking at names that you know are not sensitive to COVID and pay their bills and pay back their debt, trading from L plus 450 to L plus 1250 at attractive and volatility is built into that. Those are incredible value opportunities for our investors. So I guess the way I'd answer your question is we had a lot of fixed strike vol. For way left tail events, we have float and strike vol, often in the form of credit protection. And we like to buy things when things are imploding, when the market's imploding. So that was a great opportunity for us to, with outsized pain comes outsized opportunity. You just have to be not the one that's forced to unwind, but the one that's able to put capital to work. And again, that ties to our core values, the opportunistic side, and the balanced, non-correlated side. It was a great opportunity to build alongside the book out. The paradox of the risk off is that just when assets get their cheapest and most inviting to buy, there's no capital to do so. And that's basically what got them there in the first place. But when you have a, an effective hedge portfolio, it's empowering you to be that buyer when no one else can be. The other part about the hedge, and this is where I wanted to pivot, if you own those hedges pre-pandemic, they exploded in value, whether it was on the credit side or the derivative side, in a way that we hadn't seen since, let's call it 2008. And the hedge becomes really worth something. And it also becomes very risky when you're carrying something at 60, 70, 80 vol, that can very soon go to 50, especially, and this is where, Dave, I wanted you to really weigh in, especially when the government is now really trading against you. In other words, the government wants this thing to get back on track. The Fed wants it to get back on track. They're playing their role as buyers of last resort, lenders of last resort. And so how do you balance that where you kind of see that the hedges that you're carrying have gotten very expensive and risky in some ways set against the government intervention that's likely to be coming? I think that's why you need that floating strike protection, because at the end of the day, especially if the timing of your hedges is short duration, you're talking much more, there's obviously theta, but as you bought in most of your deltas or a large portion of your deltas well through strike. And this is more art than science, by the way. It's impossible in a moment like that to pick, quote unquote, when it will stop. But as you and I have mentioned, when there's no capital to buy things, is often a good indicator, that capitulation moment. We have bought in a lot of our delta hedges at that point. Now, that protects us from the moral hazard argument or the government involvement argument. And in fact, in the later stages of March into April, we were selling stock, you know, on bounces. There were moments that we were trading through strikes and we were able to really trade stock around or S&P around on both sides of different strikes. We believe in monetizing and trading around hedges. The thing to keep in mind is that if I have a short credit book and it's highly convex because of the structuring of it, you know, we mentioned the duration blowouts and the cost was 80 bips running for five years to be short those credits. We did take some of those off as they went to 300, 400, 500 over. We did take some of that off. But more importantly, I was buying L plus 700, 800, 900, 1200 plus call option expressions of the convertible market. So there's basis risk reflected by time, of course, between these different asset classes. But as I mentioned, my investors are long term. So the nature of our book, the character of the book, didn't require me to close all those. We closed some, but the long side got built cheaper and better. And again, not just at wider credits, but with call options on the equities that nobody cared about at the time. Think about something like SPACs. When you can pick up low double digit levered returns for call options for US treasuries, well, that gives you a lot of room to think about taking your hedges down if your investors can be longer term and you have capital to meet margin calls and buy more. And the same is true for wider credit. So I think it's overly simplistic to say, how do you trade your hedges? Well, one of the way we trade our hedges, because again, we don't really think about it. It's all one book, right? There's no portfolio hedge book, but we have macro expressions like portfolio hedges is to build out the long side at better prices. 
when things rally, you're going to make money. And it's just a matter of time. So closing out hedges, the other option is buying really good loans. And I think we did a lot of the latter. So you mentioned SPACs. I'd love for you to take us through your rendering of this asset class. There's folks that are buying it just to own it. There are people that are worried about that from a long-term standpoint, but then there's a more of a quantitative implementation of trading SPACs. Give us a big picture as to how you and your firm look at the asset class and why you see a lot of opportunity there. Well, we've probably been involved in it on a personal level for far longer than I'd even care to remember, but the SPAC business at DB reported up through me at Deutsche on the convertible side of the business. So I'm familiar with structuring, how the products evolved over time, the different underwriters, the different sponsors, the entire sort of evolution of the product from sort of a 10 or $20 billion market cap to what it is now. And it's gone through different iterations, right? We've had these ebbs and flows, supply kind of overwhelming, demand at different periods of time, and a very quickly evolving structural change, whether that means changes in warrant coverage, duration, the enhanced trust value, incentives that you can give investors, even founders class shares to make deals work at different moments in time. I mean, at its core, there's a real misunderstanding of SPACs. People talk about SPACs are going to blow up. Well, Again, think of it this way. It, it is a long-only convertible backed by U.S. Treasuries before a SPAC acquires a company. After it acquires a company, it's a stock like any other. There might be warrants left over and things like that, but it has a linear payoff. So when people say SPACs generically have risk, I'm not saying they're wrong. They actually are right, especially at this moment in time. But the structure provides a large amount of downside protection at inception. It's not a you know, when you see like a de spac equity trade to three or it's a fraud or whatever, that's just a stock at that point. It's not a SPAC. There's a combination that's been made. I think a lot of people continue to sort of misunderstand the actual nature of the product. That being said, there were two pronounced buying opportunities in SPACs. One was in March when the entire macro backdrop was uncertain. And one was in October when the macro backdrop was more certain but the supply imbalance was pronounced. And you had a backup in pricing in October that resembled SPAC pricing in March in a much better macro environment than you were obviously dealing with in March. So again, SPACs relative to the world in October were an incredible buying opportunity, one in which we took our exposure as a percentage of NAV from let's say 50% to almost 150% of NAV using leverage. That opportunity, unfortunately, is not with us now. Most of the new entrants to this back product, depending on their relationships and their experience in the product, what they've done to add value to sponsors over time, either via backends or structuring, and again, working with these individuals as they look to acquire companies, they're raising money that they can't participate at the maximum convexing point. So when you buy a SPAC at 10, it's like a convertible at par, and you're pretty close to a bond floor that gives you good downside protection. When you just raise the SPAC fund because SPACs are super hot, your entry point is more likely 1050 or 1070. So let's say a 5 to 7% on lever day one. That's not a reasonable condition to continue in financial markets, as you know. So we've done this a long time. You can't name a product that breaks up 5 to 7% every day without there being some sort of a change in terms or a change in price. And I think the last two weeks, we've seen the prices come down quite a bit. And a lot of players that thought of this as quote unquote free call options take a little bit of a beating, again, because their margin of safety was lower than it should have been if their entry point was the IPO price, right? They're just farther away from a quote unquote bond floor. And that's been a lot of the story of the last week or two. And I think X by and large remain relatively expensive on a data-driven basis if you're thinking about forward returns versus where they have been historically. And that's because we're in a market that tremendously overvalues call options. There's a lot of exuberance. And in SPACs in particular, that's reflected in pricing and retail demand and all sorts of high momentum participants in a market that is not cheap to where it has been historically where it was as recently as three months ago when it was a lot, 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 lot cheaper. So again, SPACs are a little bit misunderstood. They're a great long-term product to be involved with. Most of the trading is data-driven. And a lot of the alpha, though, comes from understanding, I think, not just sponsors, but also margin of safety structurally 
uh, having a good feel for the marketplace. And I think you're going to have a little bit of an unwind, just given some of the kind of irresponsible buying activity and the quality of sponsors we've come to market. We've seen coming to market for the first time. This mania has been pretty pronounced. So last thing I would say on SPAC theme, this is why we only do one book, why we only have one fund. I mean, we've had investors ask us to do SPAC funds. But that position that we've earned in the marketplace, that ability to enter SPAC at 10 or you know par effectively, if it was a convertible, not at 105, that's valuable to our investors. And again, philosophically, that's why we have a single book concept and we don't want to cannibalize those investor returns or our long-term partners that are LPs in our fund by all of a sudden raising a bunch of money because we can in SPACs. So that would be irresponsible. It's not something we're going to do. Well, you make this big distinction between the de spacked result of the, you, now you've got a company and people are probably paying too much for the hope and dream of massive upside. And then you have the period beforehand, which is, I believe, in your rendering more of a, a vol trade. And if you think about the equity option side of things, one of the things that has really been a post-pandemic result is that the options market is just undersupplied in terms of vol sellers. There's this pretty persistent, I guess I would call it imbalance between the demands that are coming from retail for gamma, you know, short dated upside calls, and then the ability of the street, especially through this risk recycling process to sell vol has been compromised by all the loss experienced last March. Is it the case that the vol aspect of trading SPACs has just been a better deal to source convexity than the equity derivatives market from your standpoint? There's a natural attraction to the structure. Again, there's the convexity component to the structure, but just like any asset class, that convexity and the value of it depends on the price. And so again, I agree with you, and I think we're kind of saying the same thing, you know, that the YOLO call buying effect working hand in hand with retail SPAC demand or new entrant institutional stack demand, they're kind of part of the same phenomenon. I would agree with you there. The point at which I maybe disagree is that it's not really a vol trade and the same way buying calls is not really a vol trade. You know, those are directional investors. It's the same thing with SPACs. And by the way, I think there's a potential opportunity to do this, but there's very few people who think about SPACs and there are reasons why it's difficult to do so as a vol oriented product. It's an event driven product as a call option. It's like a knock-in call option. So to the degree that the market has a plethora of upside call buyers on a short-term basis looking for quick moves up in high-profile, high-momentum, retail-driven stories, absolutely, the SPAC market participates in the same phenomenon. And just like that call buying phenomenon, you have a tremendous amount of risk when you're buying that stuff at the wrong price. And SPACs are no exception to that. Well, let's finish our lively conversation with a survey of the macro as a CIO and someone who's responsible for a cross-asset book, you're playing whack-a-mole like the policymakers are as well. Things are popping up out of nowhere in terms of things you didn't think were going to happen and markets are responding to a whole host of risks. Give us the big picture of how you think about that and how you incorporate the macro element of the realities of our risk environment into your process, which tends to seem to be very bottoms up, but you obviously also do a fair amount of macro overlay as well. So I don't think you could separate the two. I think anybody who thinks that their price action within a given asset class or instrument other than something hyper idiosyncratic is somehow immune from a macro narrative or the dominant macro narrative or shift in that narrative. I just think that's incorrect. I think the macro narrative is generally along with very technical factors like supply and demand even, give you the opportunity to enter and exit thematic expressions at attractive levels. So we don't really separate between the two. We just make sure that we underwrite our expressions with a very heavy fundamental bottoms up process, to your point. Now, the macro environment that has kind of dominated, I would argue since 87, but certainly since 2008 has been this engineered outcome. Money effectively is free. So we can look at our success by the value of the S&P and hope that that somehow generates some trickle down inflation into the regular economy. 
That's been the monetary approach to really all financial markets since 08. We've seen that most pronounced, obviously, in, in rates. And when people think of that as a safety net, they're pushed out the risk curve. There's, I'm not saying anything novel here, but I feel like that's been the case for some time. And it took the world outside of professional investors a decent amount of time to realize that was the world we were in. And so for me, the biggest risk factor is how that narrative can change how that big picture perspective might be changing right now. And so what are we seeing that's new? Well, we're obviously seeing steepening in the, in the yield curve. That's been a, a warning sign before for drawdowns and has prompted quick reassurance from the Fed that they'll be there holding the market's hands. What I do think is different and notable is that this potential shift from monetary policy as a way to generate real growth or quote unquote, you know, inflation as growth to fiscal. And I think this goes hand in hand with politics. So, you know, we've had a shift, you know, I don't know if you noticed, but Kuroda a month ago sort of talking about try to engineer inflation. We use every tool in our box and we failed. And then, you know, you have Yellen speaking about wealth inequality. Those kind of comments, I think, are a result of a shift in the wind a little bit. And we've seen that both in the election and in some of the polarization and sort of class warfare overlay among stories, even like the GameStop story. And so for me, what I think of as a bigger picture of macro concern is really just being aware of the fact that you might be able to engineer inflationary outcomes, especially as policy shifts towards things like raising the minimum wage or infrastructure or UBI, whatever that might be, you might generate real inflation, but it's really about belief and credibility. If the Fed couldn't create inflation doing what it was doing before, which is monetary, and they say, let us run it hot and we can control it and the policy shifts fiscal. And not only that, it's a policy that doesn't explicitly target financial assets as the scorecard for success, which we've heard Trump for many years talk about, hey, everybody loves me, I'm doing great, stock market's up. Well, that may not be the same scoring method that other political parties use and ones that are ascendant right now. That's a very important change in terms of thinking about risk and the potential for outcomes to be different. Because if you're not prioritizing S&P returns, and your goal is actually different from a fiscal perspective, I think you can end up in a situation where you do create inflation and potentially there's a risk of inflation sort of being something that people question whether the Fed can control. And there's obviously, I think, in our future, things like yield caps and people talk about that. But all of this translates into the currency. And so I think a lot of what we do from the macro side beyond sort of the short-term factor stuff that we talked about earlier it's trying to understand interesting convex ways to think about currency as the ultimate outlet for this macro narrative unfolding over long periods of time. So I do think there's a lot going on. And I think there's, I think we're in for a big change in sort of theme, I believe, over time. And I'm not sure exactly where that ends. But I think in terms of how you construct your book, and I said this at the outset, we don't predict things because we're not that good. We construct books that are durable for risk considerations. That's a risk consideration we are preparing for. And I think you should be thinking about as you construct your portfolio, if you want to have good, durable, long-term returns for a long period of time. So I guess that touches on some of the macro, some of the politics, without getting too specific on what those themes are. There's some important stuff that I think stories are kind of shifting around here. And that's really notable from an investor perspective. Well, we will leave it there, DP. It's been excellent to catch up. Our guests will... Enjoy the conversation, I'm sure, and I want to thank you for your time today. Thanks, Steve. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the Alpha Exchange. Before we go, I wanted to share with you an inspirational investment symposium I'm hosting on May 11th and 12th on behalf of Macrominds, the foundation I launched in 2018 in order to raise money for nonprofits that focus on helping improve educational opportunities for children in the New York area. Our initiative is based on two primary ideas. First, educational shortfall for families is self-reinforcing. One statistic, the children of college-educated parents are seven times as likely to go to college as are those whose parents did not finish high school. Working together, we can help push back against this cycle. The second idea behind Macrominds is that the community of finance professionals is at its best when we engage together on the many difficult questions out there. Disinflation, crowded trades, monetary policy, cryptocurrencies, 
and the cost of hedging are just a few of these. Set against these uncertainties, what are the considerations most relevant to portfolio construction? What's the next big thing in finance and markets? On May 11th and 12th, these important topics will be explored. I couldn't be more excited to bring to you such accomplished market professionals who are offering their time and providing their insights. I hope that you will consider both attending and sponsoring the event. More on MacroMinds and the symposium can be found on our webpage, macroMinds.org. On behalf of our partner charities, I sincerely thank you for your support. Thank you.